Has it ever seemed funny to you the way the King James Bible uses the word offend? Understandest thou what thou readest in the King James Version when thou encounterest this word? For example, I've spent 30 years considering the teaching of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount because I want my life's house to be built on a rock. I want to be a wise man. And for the first 10 or so of those years, I was mainly reading that sermon in the King James. In it, Jesus uses the word offend several times. Here's a key one. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. That's Matthew 5:29, and it's going to come up again. When has your right eye ever offended you? When have you ever been like, I cannot believe my stupid eye just said that terrible thing about me? Or is it more like, seeing that advertisement on television was offensive to me. In other words, my eye offended me. In that case, the eye isn't causing the offense, just recording it. Really, what is Jesus saying here? It would be nice to know because it's clearly serious. Whatever it means for an eye to offend, the result, Jesus says, is that I should pluck that eye out or take this use of the word offend. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. This is serious, we've got to know what offend means. Do little ones even get offended, however? In my experience, they get hurt or angry at being teased, but their level of understanding makes me think that I can't think of times when my kids, for example, have been offended. That feels like a word that's used to describe at least teenagers, usually adults. I could be wrong about this, but here's another one. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples at the Last Supper. All ye shall be offended because of me this night. That's Matthew 26, 31. Doesn't that just seem a little bit weird? The disciples were scared. They fled Jesus in cowardly betrayal. But at what point were they offended because of Jesus? At what point did they say, I can't believe Jesus said that about us? And here's one that causes some problems. Paul writes in Romans, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Romans 14, 21. If the Bible tells me I have to avoid doing anything that offends fellow Christians, I will obey. But I usually don't know when others are offended by my actions. And this is a pretty constricting command, right? Am I to live at the mercy of others' proneness to take offense? I am not mocking scripture here. I want to understand it, don't you? Is this really what Paul means? Don't do anything that offends anybody else. King James English also uses prepositions in a funny way with the word offend. And I'm at times left just kind of scratching my head a bit. At the very least, this is just not the way we would say it. Or maybe, possibly, am I missing some meaning here that the King James translators intended to get across to me? Jeremiah said unto King Zedekiah, What have I offended against thee, or against thy servants, or against this people that ye have put me in prison? That's Jeremiah 37, 18. We would not say, what have I offended against thee in a situation like that. We'd say, how have I offended you, right? Or take this one, speaking of the way people from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth reacted to him. And they were offended in him. Have you ever heard anyone say they were offended in someone else? Last one, Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me that which thou puttest on me will I bear. Doesn't that strike your ear in a funny way? We would say, I have offended you, not I have offended, full stop. It's not an intransitive verb for us, usually, anyway, right? I've been thinking a lot about something a local pastor told me once. I put it in authorized, actually. He said to me, I would say you and I have approached this subject from different angles. Where we both have come across difficulties of understanding, I have seen it as part of my Bible study and have not considered it as a translation issue. I said in my book that I admired that pastor's spirit. When you come across something difficult in the Bible, this ought to provoke study. But this pastor's perspective inadvertently omitted something very important, the effects of language change. If the difficulty of some Bible statement or other is due to what God said, then I need to suffer and pray and work through that difficulty. I need to study. But if the difficulty comes from the way English has changed over time, then this is an unnecessary difficulty, a difficulty that's been added on to that first kind of difficulty. Something is going on with this word offend. 
sometimes in the King James, it doesn't mean what I'll bet most readers assume it means. It is, as I am about to explain, a false friend, a misleading mismatch between Elizabethan English and contemporary English. But because our contemporary senses of the word offend still work in most of the King James contexts in which this word gets used, people don't always realize their misunderstanding. And because it is not the job of contemporary dictionaries to record all the archaic and obsolete senses of existing words, you might not even discover what the King James translators meant and what God meant by opening up your dictionary, because you almost certainly don't have the right dictionary, as I'll show. Regular viewers of my channel know that I have a process for studying these false friends. This one, offend, has been requested by multiple viewers. Here we go. Step one. We've already noticed that offend seems a little odd in some context in the King James. That's enough to get us started, to see if this is a false friend. But there's another entry point into my false friends process. That's checking other translations. And indeed, at that key verse, Matthew 5, 29, the one I first mentioned, the King James is the only major English translation that uses the word offend. Check biblehub.com or check logos and you'll see the same thing. They say instead something like, if your right eye makes you sin. That's very different from the meaning I get in contemporary English from if your right eye offends you. We've got sufficient reason, in other words, to check to see if this is a false friend. On to step two, look up the relevant Hebrew or Greek word in a responsible original language lexicon. But the thing is here that if you check those strong numbers or hover over the relevant English words in Logos with your mouse cursor, you'll see that the King James uses the English word offend to translate a number of different Hebrew and Greek words. Logos actually has a great tool for this that I use all the time, the Bible word study. Take a look. There are eight different Hebrew words and five different Greek words that get translated offend in the King James Version. Does that make sense? Each of these sections of the ring graph, as we call it at Logos, represents a different Greek or Hebrew word that gets translated with the English word offend in the King James. I can change the translation too, and if I change to the highly literal NASB, for example, I predict that there will be fewer Hebrew and Greek words in each graph because the NASB tends to be a bit more consistent than the King James in employing the translation principle of concordance, that is, using the same English word to translate individual Hebrew and Greek ones. As usual, when I make a video, I was right. I don't show you the times when I guess wrong. Now we're down to five Hebrew words and just two Greek ones that are translated by the NASB with the English word offend. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna focus on the one Greek word that got used the most in these ring graphs. I usually avoid mentioning Hebrew and Greek words in my videos, but this one is just commonly known enough to warrant mention. It's scandalizo. That's a verb form. You can hear the English word scandal in it. And you're sort of free to use that as a mnemonic device to help you remember it. I say sort of because you don't ever, ever, never, ever, lever, trevor want to let yourself start thinking that a word's history has a necessary bearing on its present meaning. Just because scandalizo in ancient Greek eventually became scandal in English does not mean that scandalizo meant scandal or has anything to do with it. This also happens to be the Greek word used in the verse that I'd like to focus on though, the one with which I began this video, Matthew 5, 29. Let's find out what scandalizo meant in the Greek of Jesus' day in Matthew 5, 29 by checking BDAG, Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich. This important resource tells me that the word had two major senses in Jesus' day. One of them you will recognize, the other you won't. Let's start with the one you will recognize. To shock through word or action, give offense to, anger, shock. As we'll see in the next step, and as you already must certainly know, this is what offend means in English today. So there are definitely places in the King James where offend is not a false friend. BDAG gives several examples. Here's one verse in which scandalizo gets translated offended and modern readers will not be misled. Then came his disciples and said unto him, knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? That's Matthew 15, 12. As I've argued, this sense just doesn't fit in Matthew 5, 29, however. How can eyes offend people? How can they shock through word or action? They can't unless Jesus is being super demanding and obscure. But BDAG gives another sense of scandalizo, and it's this, to cause to be brought to a downfall, cause to sin. The sin may consist in a breach of the moral law, in unbelief, or in the acceptance of false teachings. 
This sense, Bedag tells me, gets used numerous times in the New Testament. It's actually more common than the other sense. Whoever causes one of these little ones to sin is definitely one of them. I will never eat meat lest it make my brother stumble. That's another. Jesus' statement to the disciples in the garden uses this sense too. You will all not offend but fall away. That sense makes way more sense than you will all offend or be offended even. And that sense makes perfect sense in Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. That is, of course, how every single other major English translation takes the phrase. So did the King James translators get it wrong? Why did they say, if thine eye offend thee? We've got to move to the next step in my process, step three. We've got to look up the word offend in a contemporary dictionary. And it is, as I've been assuming you already know, offend means to cause to feel upset, annoyed, or resentful. My dictionary gives this example sentence. Viewers said they had been offended by bad language. People always tell me they don't get offended easily. And of course, it is a matter of Christian charity at times to not let yourself be offended. It's a glory to a man to overlook a transgression. But of course, it can be good to find things offensive. I'll never forget watching a corny Christian movie. I'm sorry, but most Christian movies are corny and really being affected by a particular scene. A theology professor from the past comes into our time period through a time machine, corny, and he goes to a movie with a bunch of people from the church he has found. The camera shows the back door of the movie theater from the lobby, the place where you buy popcorn. And suddenly the man from the past, there to watch a movie with a church group, comes bursting out of the theater, shouting that someone has just taken the Lord's name in vain. He was offended, deeply offended to see this. Does it say something good about us that we are not so offended? I want at times to be offended, to be offended by evil. But this just can't be what the word offend meant in the King James in 1611 in Matthew 5:29. I just cannot make any sense, not really, out of if thine eye offend thee. Not if offend meant in 1611 what it means today. Eyes can't offend unless I am to conclude that the King James translators made a mistake. And I almost never like to conclude this. There's got to be another explanation, and there is. Step four, let's turn to the Oxford English Dictionary. The OED, remember, records all the senses every English word has ever had to the best of their ability and wouldn't ch know it. There are transitive and intransitive senses of this word offend that fit the Hebrew and Greek perfectly at some of the puzzling places I've mentioned in the King James. They're very similar. I'll just read the transitive. To be a stumbling block or cause spiritual or moral difficulty to a person, to shock morally or spiritually, to cause to sin. And both of these senses are obsolete. We have a false friend. The King James translators did not make a mistake. English has simply changed over time. This sense does not exist anymore in contemporary English. Now let's get clear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that every time offend occurs in the King James, it means to cause to sin. Think of if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man. Offend there is actually translating a totally different Greek word than the one we've been discussing, that's scandalizo. This word in this verse it means stumble or trip. The syntax is a little confusing there, the word order for modern readers. It means if anybody doesn't trip up in what he says, that person is perfect. But you simply have to know that offend can at times mean cause to stumble, or you will either puzzle over or actively misunderstand a number of key King James verses. If meat maketh my brother to offend now makes a lot more sense than if you think offending has to do with saying mean things. In other words, if I eat meat, it'll make my brother offend me or something. A viewer of my channel sent me a YouTube video of a preacher who preached a whole sermon from the King James, of course, about how people shouldn't offend each other in relationships. He quoted Jesus' statement that it must needs be that offenses come. And he explained that as meaning offenses are unavoidable. In other words, we will always offend other people all the time. He brought up that verse, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by he is offended. But if you understand that offended in 1611 could mean to cause to stumble or to be caused to stumble, and actually that by and by is also a false friend. It used to mean not after a while, but immediately. If you understand these false friends, then this verse suddenly clicks into place in your mind. It makes perfect sense. And that's what we want, right? To understand what God said in scripture. Now, 
You can say that today's readers should not be lazy, that they should look up this word offend if they don't understand it. But I've been asking and asking my King James only friends till I'm blue in the face, or actually more like a puce color. How are people supposed to look up words they don't realize they're misunderstanding? Jesus says some things that are hard to be understood, just like Peter said of Paul. When they hear him say, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, people might just assume that this is Jesus being Jesus, using the shocking language that he sometimes opts for, like when he told the Syrophoenician woman, it isn't meat to give the children's bread to the dogs. I fear that too many modern people, in other words, do with this verse, Matthew 5, 29, what my pastor friend said he does. He assumed humbly that the problem was not with the translation, but with himself. But what a relief, right? To find out that the problem is not with the translation or with yourself, but with the steady process of language change. But a lot of King James defenders insist to me over and over that as Roald Dahl's BFG once said, the big friendly giant, I am barking up the wrong dog. There are no false friends in the King James, they tell me. And this leads them in maybe three different directions. First, some will tell me that offend in the King James means both the contemporary meaning and the historic meaning. It means if your eye makes you sin and if your eye makes you feel upset, annoyed, or resentful. I just can't make any sense of this. Language just does not work like this. I could go into some detail here, but it boils down to this. In good exegesis interpretation of scripture, we look for each word to make its least contribution to the sentence. You're not wanting to freight words with more meaning than they could possibly bear. Otherwise, you'll be smuggling in meaning from outside. The makes you sin meaning works excellently. It's what the Greek meant. It's what Jesus meant. It's what the King James translators clearly must have meant. We don't need to find some double meaning here. Second, some will tell me that the King James is right no matter what. So offend means offend. Hebrew and Greek are worthless. This happened to me just two days ago as I record. If thine eye offend thee means what modern English speakers take it to mean. I'm not sure if they mean that the King James translators got some kind of advanced revelation of the future of English, what offend would come to mean in our day, or if they think language just does not change, like the OED just makes up stuff about language change, or if they think that the meaning of the King James is supposed to change when English does. I just can't make good sense of this second objection in any meaning. But third, most people who deny my false friends will tell me that everybody knows what offend means in Matthew 5, 29, and I'm the only idiot who doesn't. Their small children, the people in their country church, even their Polish neighbors who just learned English last Tuesday, they all understand this verse perfectly well. It takes a PhD to misunderstand it, they tell me. I hear this over and over. If you think I'm making this up, read my comment section on YouTube. And what am I supposed to say to this? It is possible that I'm the only one who's misunderstanding it. The only rigorous answer would be to do a study to see whether King James readers today really are understanding this verse according to Jesus' intended meaning, or whether language change is getting in the way. Maybe I'll do just that, a study. I can't say, really, that the King James is offending people in that older sense, that it is making them sin. Thankfully, I think most often false friends mislead people only a little and not a lot. And there are times when I have concluded if the NIV maketh my brother to offend, to trip or stumble, I won't use it in his presence. I won't preach from it. I won't say that if a given Bible translation is making your understanding stumble because of its archaic language, pluck it out. I will say instead that looking at God's word through the cornea provided by the King James means looking at it through mild cataracts. Is it corneas where cataracts go? I can't remember. Listening to God's word in Elizabethan English means for modern English speakers that you will need some hearing aids like the ones I've taught people to use in my 50 False Friends in the King James series. Now, hopefully thou understandest what thou readest in the King James a little better.